It's an incredible moment that we're living in uh, right now. Uh, there's, there's a war on journalists in this country and around the world. And there's a war on whistleblowers. And at present, that war against whistleblowers and against journalists is being directed uh, by our constitutional law professor, Nobel Peace Prize winning Democratic president. Uh, and it is not just against American journalists uh, and US whistleblowers, uh, but it's also against journalists internationally, and I'm gonna talk about some of that tonight. But what we've seen with the revelations uh, that were presented by the leaking uh, of Edward Snowden uh, is that there is a huge national security state in this country that is engaged on any given day in acts that may be legal under US law because they've been rubber stamped by the Congress, uh, but may quite well be unconstitutional and certainly are immoral. And so serious questions are presented uh, about how people should respond to this, not just in media or in government, but how all of us should be responding to this. And I look forward to hearing from Glenn Greenwald, who really is uh, at the center of this right now. And of course, it's so predictable, the attempts to smear Glenn, to dig into his personal life, uh, to go after him, uh, because that's what happens to people who actually stand up when it matters. If you look at the case of Thomas Drake, the NSA official who tried to actually blow the whistle from within the system, what all of these pundits and, and government officials are saying Edward Snowden should have done. Thomas Drake had his life and his career ruined for doing everything they told him to do, sending his concerns up the chain of command, and they went after him, and they charged him under the Espionage Act. President Obama, under his administration, has gone after more whistleblowers under the Espionage Act than all of his predecessors over the past 100 years. He is targeting whistleblowers in an unprecedented manner. At a time when journalists' phone records are being seized, when the electronic communications of tens of millions of Americans and hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people around the world are having their data seized on any given moment. What is the end game of this? What is the point? What is, it, what is it that the state is doing right now? What the state is saying is that only official leaks will be tolerated. And we all know that Washington runs on official leaks. There's this caviar correspondent culture in Washington where everybody's friends with everybody else. The journalists hang out with the government officials and the heads of private corporations. Their kids go to fancy schools together. They do super soaker fights on the lawn of Joe Biden's house on the weekend. That's actually a true story. Journalists get invited over to Joe Biden's house to play super soaker. Good old Chuck Todd and the boys from MSNBC. So, so you have these stenographers that are given official leaks, like in the aftermath of the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad. Almost everything that was leaked to journalists by John Brennan and others turned out later to be false that Osama bin Laden was, was hiding behind one of his wives, uh, that he was reaching for a gun when he was shot. All of the leaks were intended to make the, the White House look like this was a spectacular, clean victory, and that they took out this murderous mastermind of 9-11, Osama bin Laden. And, and so seldom are the occasions when the stenographer crowd in Washington actually asks a tough question that this is largely how business is done. When the White House wants something out, they will leak it to one of the friendly journalists, and then they will write the hallmark postcard to saving the day for peace, freedom, and democracy under Democrats and Republicans. Or when they want to whip up a threat, as in the case with the lead up to the Iraq war. They know which journalists to call because they're going to print what they want, and then they can go on Meet the Press and say, well, look at what Judy Miller printed. It must be true. And that's, that's how this whole thing works. But then when you have people like Glenn Greenwald, who are not the recipients of those official leaks, and instead are developing and cultivating their own sources. Or maybe a whistleblower is going to them because they know that they're not part of the Caviar Correspondents Association, that they actually uh, believe that the role of journalists is to hold those in power accountable, not to facilitate their propaganda. When Glenn Greenwald does something like that, not only does the government come uh, raining down on him, but journalists 
from the Caviar Correspondence Association are so disgusted with the fact that someone would get a leak that wasn't them that they pile on. The message that the state is sending is that journalists are only allowed to print official statements, whether they are from public officials saying them publicly or it's being stated in off-the-record briefings or in strategic leaks. They are trying to criminalize real journalism. They are trying to criminalize whistleblowing. And this has sent a chill through the community of reporters who cover national security issues, and it has sent a chill through the community of people who work within government that were considering speaking up. If, if, if journalism is criminalized, and if whistleblowing is criminalized, then how can we say that we have a free press in this society? It means we don't actually have a free press. It means that, that, that something that is enshrined in the Constitution, the right to a free press, actually doesn't matter. And I think we're at a moment right now, because of who the president is, where we risk this becoming a permanent reality in this country. We all know that under Bush and Cheney, they were engaged in warrantless wiretapping, their foreign policy looked like Murder Incorporated, there was certainly a war against journalists and a war against dissent, but it's easy to be against those policies when cartoonish villains like Bush and Cheney are in office. When your actual principle is tested, what you, what, meaning what you actually believe, is when someone like President Obama is in office, when it's the liberals that are sending you the hate mail, when you have the, the tenacity to continue on and say, you know what, this is a principle, not a partisan game. This isn't a game at all. This has everything to do with the future, not only of this country, but with the stability and independence of nations around the world. I, I believe that journalists have an obligation to stand up and defend one another when any of them are under attack. And what has happened to Glenn and other journalists who have dared to report outside of the consensus of the Washington clique is reprehensible. And journalists should be ashamed of themselves. I want to tell you a story uh, about one drone strike that was followed by another drone strike two weeks later. And I'm going to ask you to just bear with me to uh, explain why I think this is important. I want to say at the onset that I believe that American lives are not worth a penny more than non-American lives around the world. But you can gauge, you can gauge how a society is going to view uh, people that are not its citizens by how it's treating its citizens and the lengths to which it will go to kill or deny rights to its own citizens speaks volumes to how it views the rest of the world. And for that reason, I want to tell you the story about some American citizens that were killed by their own government. Because to me, it speaks to a much bigger issue about who we are as a society and what this administration uh, is doing with its foreign policy. On September 30th, 2011, President Obama was faced with a decision. And that decision was whether or not to pull the trigger on an operation that he knew would result in the killing of an American citizen who had not been charged with a crime. And for President Obama, the decision was an easy one, and he authorized that strike. And on September 30th, 2011, President Obama authorized a drone strike in the north of Yemen that killed an American citizen named Anwar al -Laki. Alongside al in that attack was a, another American, a Pakistani American named Samir Khan. And those two were killed in this operation authorized by President Obama. That afternoon, President Obama spoke at uh, Fort Myer. And he said that a dangerous terrorist, Anwar al laki uh, was killed today in Yemen. He didn't say that the United States killed Anwar al laki He just said that he was killed in Yemen. And he identified him as being the head of external operations for al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula a label that no journalist I know and no Yemeni I know had ever heard applied to Anwar al laki before. Now who was Anwar al laki I'm sure many people have seen the YouTube videos of him, where he's wearing a camouflage jacket in front of a black flag, 
uh, calling for armed jihad, saying, I, I call on the youth in the West to either rise up in their own countries or to join us the, and the Mujahideen in the fronts of jihad around the world. And he was specifically calling on people to attack the United States in acts of armed violence. No question about that. And that's 99.9% .9 of the story that's presented when anyone talks about Anwar al-Laki. But who was Anwar al-Laki and how did he get to become the guy in front of that YouTube video with the camouflage jacket and the black flag? Al-Laki's story in many ways is an American story. It's a fascinating one. Al-Laki was born in 1971 in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And he was born in New Mexico because his father, Nasr al-Laki, was a Fulbright scholar who came to the United States in 1966. And he shared with me the essay that he wrote when he was accepted into that program and came to the US to get his education. And he said, I come from a, 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 a place that has no name. He was from Southern Arabia at the time and it was in flux in the 1960s. And the region he was from actually did not have an identifiable name as a nation state. And he said, I view America as an inspiration to the world. And its progressive spirit is what makes me want to come there for my education. And he spoke about wanting to build a family and raise them in the image of the history he had read about the United States of America. Now, if you read some of the books of Haymarket books, it's clear that maybe he wasn't reading that history. <laughs> but, but he certainly was reading the history many of us are, are raised on in this country. So fair game to Dr. Nasser al-Laki for having read that history. So he comes to the United States and he goes to New Mexico and he gets his degree, and then he brings his young wife over to the United States, and his plan was to spend his life in America. And in 1971, his first child is born, Anwar. And he said, you know, I, at that time, it was legal to hand out cigars in the hospital, and he said, I handed out cigars with It's a Boy on them to everyone. And, uh, and he starts raising his son, and, and, and Anwar's first language was English. And they're moving around according to his uh, academic pursuits. They're in New Mexico, then they're in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota when he's at the university and his wife Saleha gets her GED and is working at a candy factory to support her husband while he's getting his education and and their plan is to build their family and keep them in the US but then Nasr al-Laki was offered an opportunity to come back to Yemen and to help with funding from the United States government to start a Department of Agricultural Engineering in Sana'a so he moves his family uh, back there in the early 1980s and Anwar is raised among the elites in Yemen, all of the diplomats' kids, the children of the dictator of Yemen, they all go to these elite schools and English remains his primary language. His father goes on to become a major figure at the university and when Anwar graduates from high school, he decides to go back to the United States to get his college education. And he goes out to Colorado and it was just as the so-called Gulf War was beginning and he was never a particularly political guy and was not a religious guy. But he got involved with anti-war organizing on the campus in Colorado and started to speak out against the Gulf War. He was invited at, at, at one of these meetings that he, that he was going to with anti-war organizing to speak at a mosque in Denver. And he goes and gives a speech at the mosque and the imam at the mosque said, you know, you have a real gift for speaking. Uh, I think you should consider coming back here every Friday and sometimes we'll let you lecture and you can work with young people. And Anwar gets totally taken with this new identity of himself uh, as, a, as a young Muslim and decides that he wants to become an imam. And so he veers away from university studies and starts engaging in Islamic, studying of Islamic scholarship. And he ultimately becomes an imam. In fact, I was just in Minneapolis the other day and I met a young woman who's Somali that told me that she had been a member of Anwar al-Laki's mosque in the early days. And she said the thing that drew a lot of us there were his sermons on racism. That he was often quoting Malcolm X and that he was visiting a lot of prisoners and doing support for the families of people who were in prison. I've met other people that were at his mosques in those early days too and all of them talked about him being very, very sharp on racial politics and that that was one of the main themes of his sermons. He ends up getting transferred to a mosque in San Diego and ultimately ends up in Washington, D.C., actually in Falls Church, Virginia. And on 9-11, he was the imam at a large Islamic center, the Dar al-Hijra Mosque. 
And when 9-11 happened, uh, Anwar Awlaki became a sort of media celebrity in the United States. Not among the alternative media, but the corporate media. And the reason he was a celebrity is because he would be interviewed on NPR, or profiled in the Washington Post, or interviewed on the NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, because what he was saying is, I condemn the terrorists who committed the 9-11 attacks, and I believe that Al-Qaeda is perverting the religion of Islam. But he also was calling for caution against criminalizing the religion of Islam and was condemning the attacks that were happening against the Muslim community in the United States. He became a guy that for the corporate media was helping to make sense of the experience of many American Muslims in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. In fact, he was considered to be such a mainstream member of society that he was invited by the Pentagon to give, speak, uh, be the keynote speaker at a Pentagon luncheon soon after 9-11. And just to give you a sense of how bad the intelligence was at the time of the Pentagon, one of the things that they served at this e luncheon was a bacon sandwich with, <laughs> when Imam Anwar al was speaking to them. al though, while he was speaking in public and saying he went so far as to say that the United States had a right to go into Afghanistan militarily, to pursue those responsible for 9-11, which was very much in sync with the mainstream of American popular opinion at the time. Anwar al-Laki, though, was dealing with something else behind the scenes, and that was that he was being investigated and interrogated by the FBI. He was hearing the stories of Muslims that would come into his mosque about their businesses being vandalized. One woman, soon after 9-11, Muslim woman from his community, was beaten in a hate attack with a baseball bat and stumbled into the mosque. 1,200 Muslims were detained around the United States in the aftermath of the attacks. Muslim charities were targeted. Muslim-owned businesses were visited by the FBI. We now know part of the extent to which the CIA was working with the NYPD in targeting Muslim restaurants and Muslim establishments. This was happening in a very intense way after 9-11, and al was dealing with it. And they were questioning him about the fact that some of the 9-11 hijackers had come to sermons at his mosques, and they were trying to see if there was a link between al and the 9-11 hijackers. And al was under this tremendous pressure from the US government, and he was responding to many of the people coming into his mosque and hearing their stories at a time when the US was gearing up to invade Iraq. And he started to become politicized in a very different way, and his sermons started to take on a sharper tone. And ultimately, he decided that he wanted to leave the United States. So he goes to Britain for a while, and then back to Yemen, and he thinks he wants to go and pursue more courses in Islamic scholarship when he's back in Yemen. While he's there, his sermons are becoming more and more popular around the world because he's weaving in stories about racial politics. He was talking about the witch hunts in the uh, black community and immigrant communities in Britain. He was tying them uh, to Quranic verses and stories from the Quran and talking using pop, pop cultural references that resonated with a lot of young people. And his sermons started to pop up in investigations into terror plots in Britain, the United States, and Canada. And the US began to put pressure on the Yemeni government to silence Anwar al because of his speech at the time. And al continued to record these sermons and they were being sold in CDs, and then when the internet started to become the internet, they were getting downloaded. And in 2006, al is arrested in Yemen and put in prison on trumped up charges that he had intervened in a tribal dispute. These were charges by the Yemeni government. And he spent 18 months in prison, 17 of them in solitary confinement. The FBI came and interrogated him while he was in that prison, and they, United Nations investigated it and determined that his incarceration was extra legal. So Anwar al was, in, in a sense, a political prisoner. He was in that prison at that point. There were no allegations that he had been involved with any terror plots. They didn't like what he was saying. They said, well, his sermons are, are inspiring young Muslims in the West to engage in terror plotting. Uh, but there was no concrete evidence he was involved with anything. He believed firmly that the United States was directly responsible for his imprisonment. During the course of my reporting, I was able uh, to discover that he was right. There was a meeting after al was arrested in 2006 between John Negroponte, 
who at the time was the director of national intelligence, and of course a man who knows a tremendous amount about dirty wars from his time in Central America during the 1980s. And Negroponte told uh, a senior Yemeni official that it was the position of the United States that Anwar al should remain in prison for four or five years so that people will forget about him. So you, here you have a senior US official telling a, an official from what is effectively a client state, keep one of our citizens in your prison for four or five years so that the world forgets about him, knowing damn well that there were no real charges against him. And so while al is in prison, the only books that they really made available to him were the Quran and uh, Dickens and Shakespeare. He hated Shakespeare. He said that Shakespeare was an imperialist. <laughs> he loved Dickens and was fond of comparing characters from Dickens' novels to figures within the U.S. and Yemeni governments. Um, but if you look, review his prison writings, he was radicalized in prison and came out a totally changed man. And he, when he was released from prison, after 18 months, it was because of pressure from his family and civil liberties groups from around the world and within Yemen. He comes out of prison and starts a blog called Imam Anwar's blog. And on that blog, he develops a relationship with young Muslims around the world. And you can see he starts to take a very sharp tone opposing what the United States was doing in the world, particularly in the Islamic world. He was deeply affected by Abu Ghraib and by Guantanamo and by the lies that led the United States into the war in Iraq, and by the torture of people in countries around the world, and by the rendition flights. And he starts to become sharper and sharper in the debate about suicide bombing and whether it's permissible under the teachings of the Quran. And, and the United States all the while is putting pressure on the Yemeni government to arrest Anwar al -Laki. And eventually, al life becomes so infested with intelligence agents that he leaves the capital of Sana'a in Yemen, and goes to the south of the country. And while he's in the south of the country, he's in the, in the area that his tribe uh, controls in Shebwa province. And the United States is desperate to get him back to a place where they could force him back into prison. And so al own father, Nasser al who was close with the US government, agrees that he will go down and meet with his son because the family had been told, if you do not put al back into the custody of Yemen's intelligence services, the Americans are going to kill him with a drone. This is before any terror plots he was alleged to have been involved with took place. This is in the spring of 2009. His father goes down and says to Anwar, I want you to come back to Sana'a because the Americans are going to kill you if you don't. And al says to him, I was born free and I'm going to die free and I'm not going to let the Americans tell me which way to position my bed. And so his, that's the last time his father ever spoke to him. His father then leaves and Anwar is there. In November of 2009, Dr. Nadal Hassan opens fire in Fort Hood, Texas on his fellow soldiers and kills 13 of them and wounds many, many others. He's paralyzed himself in the operation. And within 24 hours of that shooting happening, a story was leaked in the media that Anwar al had been in email touch with Nadal Hassan. And to this day, the story persists that Anwar al had directed the Fort Hood shooting. But the emails have now been declassified. And if anything, they show that Nadal Hassan was sort of cre a creepy stalker of Anwar al -Laki. He was trying to give him a $5,000 prize. He asked al to help him find a wife. al almost offered no responses to Nadal Hassan whatsoever. Uh, and US law enforcement has actually said there's nothing to indicate al had anything to do with that plot except the fact that like hundreds and hundreds of other people around the world, he was receiving emails from this guy. But nonetheless, the, the story persists that Al-Laki was directed, in some cases it's reported, or was involved with the Fort Hood shooting. Al-Laki though sealed his own fate in a way a short time later when he published a blog post that said Nadal Hassan was a hero. And he called on other Muslims in the US military to do what Nadal Hassan did and to kill American soldiers that are going to be deploying in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a little bit of a sidebar, but I think this is interesting. Do you know what Nadal Hassan's profession was? He was a psychiatrist. And do you know that Nadal Hassan, who I think did something absolutely reprehensible, but Nadal Hassan was a psychiatrist who was treating soldiers who were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
And he was listening to their stories of what they were doing in those war zones. And he tried to report them up his chain of command and recommended that some of them be tried for war crimes. That's the guy who shot all those soldiers. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not defending what he's doing. I'm saying all of these stories have a backstory. No one becomes who they are in a vacuum. The story of what happened to Nadal Hassan is, is in a way similar to what happened to Anwar al -Laki. They didn't just pop out of nowhere, read the Quran, and decide, I'm going to shoot some people. There, there, there were things that happened. And in this case of these people that I'm talking about, things that happened that the US government was directing that helped create the people that they became. So al -Laki praises this act by Nadal Hassan, and that, for many Americans, I think was enough to say, Anwar al laki is a terrorist. That's really when the campaign started to say, you know, this guy is a terrorist and he's dangerous. That was the last blog he wrote. The CIA shut down his website, and, and al laki was forced to go underground. Meanwhile, back in Washington, a new president is in office, President Obama. And he comes in with almost no military experience, with no military experience, almost no foreign policy experience. And he is briefed by Admiral William McRaven, the commander of the Joint Special Operations Command, General Stanley McChrystal, who ran JSOC for the entire uh, Bush era, and then was picked by Obama to, to lead the surge in Afghanistan, by General David Petraeus, one of the most powerful figures at the time in Ameri modern American military history, uh, and the heads of all of these intelligence agencies, who paint a picture for Obama of a world where there are uh, thousands of concurrent threats against the United States, plots to bring down airplanes, poison water supplies, attack American embassies. And they say to Obama, uh, if you don't continue the authorizations that Bush gave us to strike outside of declared battlefields, and in fact, in some cases, if you don't expand them, then we're going to get hit. And Rahm Emanuel, your lovely mayor, and, and uh, other political hacks within the administration, are listening in on these briefings. And they're saying, they're envisioning what a one-term presidency looks like if there is an attack like that on US soil. And so a political calculation was made that it's better to be aggressive and engage in a form of pre-crime or preemptive strikes uh, against terrorist networks than to risk anything happening to the United States. And so Obama gives them authorities that they could only have dreamt uh, about, JSOC and the CIA. So one of the first things that Obama does, in addition to surging in Afghanistan and authorizing an escalation of night raids, is to give JSOC permission to start bombing Yemen. And so in, on December 17, 2009, about a month after the Nadal Hassan uh, shooting incident happened, President Obama authorizes his first strike on Yemen. And they say that they're taking out a dangerous leader of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And it's, he's in an area called Al Majla in Abiyan province. And they authorized the strike with cruise missiles. They couldn't use drones because they were all at the time being used to bomb Pakistan. So they had to use cruise missiles launched from the sea. They, they hit the area in Al Majla. And the next day, the Yemeni government issues a press release saying that Yemen's Air Force had taken out an Al Qaeda training camp and killed 34 Al Qaeda terrorists. And the United States then sent a note of congratulations to the Yemeni government, praising them for their cooperation in the fight against Al Qaeda. And this story goes around the world. But then, a funny thing happened on the way to the victory dance. A brave young Yemeni journalist named Abdullah Haider Shaya traveled to that village with tribal leaders. And he took photographs of the missile parts. And he took photographs of the victims of the bombing being pulled from rubble. And what his photographic evidence showed, and what the testimony of eyewitnesses showed, was that far from being an Al-Qaeda training camp, this was a Bedouin village. And that among the dead were 14 women and 21 children. And the missile parts, when they ultimately were sent to Amnesty International by Abdullah Lahider Shaya, and then reviewed by munitions experts, they were shown to be Tomahawk cruise missile parts and cluster bombs. Cluster bombs are basically like flying landmines. They just shred everything in their path. And most nations around the world have signed on to conventions banning cluster bombs, but the United States has refused because it continues to use them. 
So he reports this around the world, and his reporting was picked up by ABC News, NBC News, the Washington Post. The world over, it became clear that the United States was in fact bombing Yemen. And we knew that because of this one journalist who went to the scene, a place that the US and Yemeni governments never thought someone would go, and took pictures and interviewed survivors. A short time after he did that and went on TV talking about it, Abdullah Haider Shia was arrested by Yemen's US trained counterterrorism unit. And they took him to a political security prison in Yemen and they beat him bloody. And they said, if you keep talking about the American missile strike, we're gonna put you back in here for good. He did what I think any brave real journalist would do. He went out of that prison when they dumped him on the street straight to Al Jazeera's studio and said, the Yemeni regime is threatening me and telling me the Yemeni regime is threatening me and telling me that if I don't stop talking about al Majla and the American bombing campaign that they're going to put me back in prison and he said I'm going to continue reporting on this story and he did. He continued reporting on that story. He continued reporting on that story until his house was raided in a night raid and he was abducted and disappeared for 34 days. And then he was hauled into a political court that was set up by the Yemeni regime specifically to prosecute journalists for crimes against the dictatorship. And he was put in a cage in that courtroom. And we show this in, the, in our film. He was put in a cage uh, in that courtroom and was charged with being an Al Qaeda facilitator. And he was ultimately sentenced to five years in prison. Every major human rights organization and media freedom organization in the world condemned his trial. He, re he refused to even present a defense. He had the best lawyers in Yemen come forward and say, we'll defend you. And he said, I don't want any of you to speak a word on my behalf in this court because I will not even recognize that it's a legitimate court. I will not put on a defense. And all he said was that my crime and the reason I'm here is for being a journalist. And, and he said, this is what they do to real journalists in Yemen. They use your reporting as evidence of a crime that you've committed and they put you in prison for it. I have extensively reviewed his journalism over the years. His tough questioning of Al Qaeda leaders puts to shame the clowns in the front row at the White House press corps. He had the audacity. He had the audacity to confront Al Qaeda figures about their targeting of civilians to their faces and, and to present them with, with statements that they made and, and that contradicted verses of the Quran. Can you imagine what that would require for a Yemeni journalist to sit down with an Al Qaeda figure and do a hardball interview with them? I mean, this fluff that happens with Chuck Todd and the gang, they're, they're cowering in front of the Secretary of State, who, you know, who doesn't have the ability uh, necessarily to, to, well, shave his beard maybe or whatever. No, but this guy could have been killed, and he's asking those questions, and, and, and these clowns are asking whether Beyonce was lip syncing at the inauguration, which I think she was, but that's beside the point. <laughs> so he gets sentenced to five years in prison, and there is outrage in Yemen over this. And there are po posters hung around the Capitol demanding his uh, release from prison. And the dictator at the time, Ali Abdullah Saleh, is under huge pressure and decides, you know, he's served enough time, I think he gets the message that he needs to shut up, uh, I'm going to pardon him. Word leaks in the Yemeni media that he's going to issue this pardon. That day, the dictator of Yemen gets a phone call from the White House. Not from some undersecretary, uh, not from a staffer, not from Joe Biden, from President Obama himself. And President Obama says to the Yemeni dictator that the United States is deeply concerned about reports that you're going to release Abdullah Haider Shia. And that day, the pardon was torn up. And Abdullah Haider Shia remains in prison to this day. He has been in prison for three years. Three weeks ago, he smuggled a message out of the prison where he's in solitary confinement. Uh, I've spoken with people who have visited him and they say he's losing his mind. I, as I think I, almost anyone would if you're in those conditions. But he smuggled a message out and it said, I understand that there are journalists in the United States and elsewhere uh, that have taken up my cause and I thank them. But I don't want people to say 
that the Americans are keeping me in prison. There's only one person keeping me in prison, and that's President Obama. And if you think about, well, hold on. If you think about where we are right now in this country and the war on journalists, there's a war on journalism around the world. And it's not just the US government. Uh, there are tyrants around the world that are targeting journalists, locking them up in prison. Record numbers of journalists have been killed around the world. And in this country, we have a, 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 the idea of a democratic press under attack, but we also have a pre constitutional lawyer president who somehow thinks that it's right to intervene in, inside of Yemen and to have a journalist kept in prison whose real crime seems to be interviewing people that we're told are the enemies and exposing US missile strikes in that country. Now, now ABC News and the Washington Post and NBC News all were happy to run the journalism of Abdullah Haider Shia when he was interviewing Anwar al laki because it was salacious and it grabbed headlines and they had their exclusive. But then when he's locked up in prison, not a single one of those outlets have said anything about his imprisonment. And when I asked someone from one of the, a very prominent journalist from one of those networks, why have none of you spoken out in his defense? He told me, well, the White House called all of us uh, after you did that story, because I did a story about this when he was put in prison. And they said, don't buy into that. Uh, he's using the money you guys pay him to fund Al Qaeda. Now, I know that American journalists are some of the cheapest bastards on earth when it comes to paying other journalists in other countries to work with them. If that's Al Qaeda's fundraising strategy to, to, to get a couple hundred bucks from ABC News, then, they're, then, then they are, truly are decimated, if that, as, as you know, we're now told. But the, but the point is, when, when there's a whiff of, 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 of need to dissent from the official line, the powerful journalists in this country cower in a corner. It's the same way that they throw Glenn Greenwald under the bus and why Bradley Manning becomes some kind of a scared degenerate in a corner of a cell somewhere. They're afraid of their own shadows. They're afraid of their own shadows. They don't need anyone to tell them what to print and what not to print. They just do it for the government. And, 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 and while, while on the issue of Bradley Manning for a moment, look at the way he was smeared. Look at the way he was smeared. They tried to make his sexual orientation and his choices in life that have nothing whatsoever to do with the stories that were broken because of his courage. They tried to make that the story front and center. He's a scared transgender, cowering in a corner. He's confused about his sexuality. All those stories being done about Bradley Manning, how he's suicidal. Then what happens? Then audio leaks out of his court martial proceeding. And what do you hear when you hear Bradley Manning? You hear a calm, collected, principled young person who said, I was not going to stand by and continue to participate in these actions. And I felt I needed to speak up. The next time, the next time someone who stands up gets smeared like that, re remember what they told you was true about Bradley Manning, and then what you heard when he actually got to speak for himself, because it was two different worlds. One that was being painted, by the government and its allies in the media, and the other just by the person himself. And, 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 and when, it, when it comes down, down to who to believe, I believe Bradley Manning's portrayal of his own self and his own principles over anything that they write in the media. So you have President Obama authorizing bombing in Yemen. You have Anwar al laki now uh, underground and realizing that the United States is bombing Yemen. And then in early 2010, you have President Obama uh, actually authorizing uh, the assassination of Anwar al laki that he was placed on a kill list by the Joint Special Operations Command. And for two years, the Obama administration was hunting Anwar al laki And they tried to, by my count, kill him upwards of a dozen times. And eventually, uh, they did kill him on September 30th, 2011. But not before his family had tried to file suit just to demand that the government provide proof that Anwar al laki was an operational terrorist, that he was involved actively with terror plots against the United States. And instead of presenting that evidence in court, the Obama administration invoked the state secrets privilege. And they, they submitted affidavits from CIA Director Leon Panetta, Defense Secretary Robert Gates, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, and all of them said, 
We have evidence against Anwar al awlaki but if we were to present it in court, it would threaten the national security of the United States. So what they said is, we have the right to assassinate an American citizen without charging them with a crime, and we don't even need to show the other branch of government, another branch of government, any evidence to indicate that we're, we're authorized to do this or that it is legal to do this. I mean, that, that's chilling when that declaration is made uh, because it's, it's like an edict. It's, it's some kind of a, a, like, a, like an order of a monarch or something. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's supposed to be one of the things that separates dictatorships from democratic societies is the idea that people have a right to face their accusers, to know the evidence against them, and then to have a fair trial. But if you just have people that say, well, with a, a you know, move, of, move of, a, of, a, of a pen, right. It's like the, the, the uh, Alice in Wonderland, you know, verdict first, trial later. I mean, it's the, or I'm far less poetic than the actual book, but, but that's the point here. So they failed to do, you know, they failed to do that. They challenged it in court, bless the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights for trying. And then they kill, they kill Anwar al awlaki and they kill Samir Khan. And there were two basic reactions in Washington, silence and celebration. Hillary Clinton sounded just like John McCain in praising you know, the, this, this great victory in the war against terrorism. Uh, then it emerged that Samir Khan, this other American that was killed, wasn't actually a target. That's what they said in this strike. And a Republican congressman said, well, if he wasn't a target, he should, he should have been. Uh, and he's called it a twofer, like it was a bonus, a bonus kill. Now, I'm willing to concede for the sake of argument that everything President Obama, now 600 days after al was killed, President Obama finally admitted that it was the US that killed him, their own citizen. I'm willing to concede though that everything they've said about Anwar al is true just for the sake of argument. That Anwar al was involved with the underwear bomb plot. That he was involved with the Fort Hood shooting. That he was involved with plots to try to poison US water supplies. Okay, let's put all that out on the table. If that's true, then how do we deal with someone in our society who is guilty of those things or is accused of doing those things? Do we just execute them? Do we round up the posse and get the pitchforks and go and just you know, deliver citizens justice? Or, or is the way that we handle those cases perhaps the greatest test of what kind of society we are? The most complicated cases. When, when, when someone is truly reprehensible or engaged in something that is nefarious, how do you handle them? If, 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 as the president said, you have a sniper pointing a weapon at a, room, at a group of innocent civilians, law enforcement's not going to go and get an indictment against that person to take down that sniper. But how many of these threats are actually imminent that we're facing? Since when did we believe that we can skip forward and just kill people who, even if they're engaged in plots? I mean, they're, they're supposed to be due process. If we throw that out the door, then we should stop portraying ourselves as different than nations that have no trials, that, 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 that just execute people based on the whims of a dictator or a king. We should say, well, we're actually more like Saudi Arabia than we are like Britain. Yeah. You know, I mean, stop portraying ourselves in a manner that says that we have anything to do with, with justice for all. We, we'll, we, we'll just have mob rule for some people. But two weeks after al Laki was killed, his 16-year-old son, Abdul Rahman al Laki, who hadn't seen his father for three years, was sitting in an outdoor restaurant with his 17-year-old cousin Ahmed and some other youth from their tribe when a drone appeared above them and fired a missile and blew the teenagers up. They couldn't even find more than a, a, a part of, of Abdul Rahman al -Laki's skull. And the reason that they knew it was him is because he had this huge head of hair that was sort of his rebellious trademark. He hadn't seen his father for three years, was being raised by his grandfather, was into hip hop music and comic books and was hanging out in the square, change square, protesting against the US backed dictatorship, had nothing, was nothing like his father, and yet was killed in a drone strike. Why? The US government has never explained why that kid was killed. At first they tried to say he was 21 years old. Then the family produced the birth certificate, show, certificate showing that two months before he was killed, he had just turned 16 and that he was born in Denver, Colorado in 1995. Then they said, oh, well, he was, uh, he was with this Al-Qaeda militant named Ibrahim Albana. Then it turns out that Ibrahim Albana is still alive. See, and in fact, he's still alive to this day. And then they said, well, he was at an Al-Qaeda meeting. And then they brought forward the, the, the family members of the other people killed. And they said, well, you can investigate our lives. None of us are terrorists. So why was the kid killed? 
Well, when Robert Gibbs was asked about it, who of course is the former White House spokesperson and then was the, the chief surrogate for the Obama re-election campaign, when Gibbs was asked about it, he said he should have had a more responsible father. There, there are a few things I can think of that are more shameful than blaming the killing of a child on who their parents are. And that was Robert Gibbs' statement. And in fact, I was on Rachel Maddow's show probably for the last time ever recently, <laughs> and Gibbs was on right before me, and I wanted to be on with Gibbs because I, that was, the, I was gonna forget whatever we were talking about and go straight to asking Robert Gibbs that question. But I, I, he, was, he was on right before me. And now, you know, this is the thing. He's a paid commentator now, or whatever you call him, on MSNBC. You know, it's, I mean, it really, it truly is like state media over there. Now you've got Robert Gibbs, David Axelrod. I mean, the whole crowd just hangs out at MSNBC and then they'll go back into the White House and back out. So I'm, I was on right after him on Rachel's show and I brought, I brought up Robert Gibbs. I said, well, you know, Robert Gibbs, who you just had on, said that, that the, you know, the, the kid should have had a more responsible father. And I think that's shameful. And that Rachel was kind of like, ooh. Um, <laughs> neither here nor there. Uh, so he, he says, Harry Reid, who the Senate Majority Leader, said if there were three American citizens who deserved to be killed, it was those three. Meaning, oh. meaning Anwar al-Laki, Samir Khan, and then Abdul Rahman al-Laki. He was directly asked about those three. I, I tried repeatedly to get his office to clarify what crime Abdul Rahman al-Laki committed that, that, that you would say that he deserved to be killed. And his office would not respond to any of those uh, inquiries. So you, you have a, a deafening silence on why this kid was killed. And then the White House releases on the eve of Obama's big speech at the National Defense University this letter from Attorney General Eric Holder. And in that letter they say, they say yes, we've killed four American citizens in drone strikes. Uh, Anwar al-Laki, Samir Khan uh, in Yemen, in the, in the first one. Jude Mohammed, another American citizen who actually had been indicted uh, on terror charges, who was uh, in Pakistan. And then Abdul Rahman al-Laki. And they said only Anwar al-Laki was specifically targeted. And then they used this phrase that I'm sure was focus grouped at the CIA. They said the others were not specifically targeted. I've asked the White House to clarify if I remove the word specifically from that sentence, is it still a true statement? They won't comment on that. They said the statement speaks for itself. Actually, the statement doesn't speak for itself. What does it mean not specifically targeted? Anthony's not specifically speaking right now, but he did speak here you know, earlier. So. Um, it's, you know, it's very, it's Orwellian. It's like they redefined the word, the term imminent in that earlier Justice Department white paper. Now they use the not specifically target. Well, I think it's possible that it was a signature strike, which to me is the most egregious aspect of the Obama drone program. Signature strikes uh, are a form of bombing where the United States, de States designates certain regions of certain countries as irreconcilable areas and that anyone who is a military-aged male who is killed in those regions will posthumously be determined to have been a terrorist. And they're, they're, th these are cases where the U.S. is in fact specifically targeting people whose specific identities it doesn't know. In other words, it's, it's sort of like a grotesque form of pre-crime, like the movie Minority Report. Except in this case, there's no ball that pops up with any actual crime on it. It's just the idea that they must be up to something, so if we kill them, then we'll just say that they were terrorists. So we are targeting, the US is targeting people whose identities are not specifically known and against whom they may have no evidence that they're involved with any crimes or terrorist plots. So is not specifically targeted a group of military-aged males sitting out in an outdoor cafe in a targeted region? We, we don't know. But the answer to why that kid was killed says a lot about who we are as a society and how far we've come. And the fact that the White House refuses to just clearly state why that kid was killed is in and of itself a story. And yet no one, will, uh, no one from that White House press corps will ask the president anything about this. The signature strike program is to me the, the, the best indicator of how out of control it's gotten under this Democratic president to the point where they are engaged in a global pre-crime campaign and that they have sold this to liberals as a smarter, cleaner way of waging war. I don't believe for a moment that if John McCain had won the election in 2008, that you would see the kind of rank intellectual dishonesty and hypocrisy mm -hmm. 
that you see on a daily basis from so many liberals in this country. I mean, you know, we're going to hear from Glenn in a little while. Just go on Twitter one day and look at what is said to Glenn Greenwald constantly by the robots who are, are, are programmed somehow at the DNC to sit on their couches all day and think up new slurs to hurl at Glenn Greenwald. But, but the point here is the, the, the very same people who are yapping at me about how I'm supporting the Republicans, I'm funded by the Koch brothers, I'm an apologist for the Cato Institute. Uh, this must, the, my presence here must be boggling their minds. <laughs> um, But my, my question for them is, you know, with the next time a Republican is in office, are you going to then somehow be in favor of all these policies again? Are you do, you, do you want the big surveillance state? Do you believe in assassinating American citizens who haven't been charged with a crime? Are you going to find a way to run defense on the war against whistleblowers or the attacks against the press? Or this idea that the world actually is a battlefield and the United States has a right to deploy its military forces or drone strikes anywhere it pleases on any given day. Because if, 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 you, if you don't believe in those things, uh, but you only believe in them when, you, when your guy is in office, then it's not a principle. Then you've ceded your conscience to a politician or a political party. And, and you're not actually engaged in anything vaguely resembling an honest debate about American policy. You're just letting other people think for you. And don't think for a moment that those other people don't have massive corporate backing behind them that are pulling the, the, the levers in this machine. The, the number one thing any of us could be about if we actually want change in this society is, is to get corporations out of our political process completely. All of these policies in one way or another, whether it's foreign policies or domestic policies, when we're looking at the situation with schools uh, here in Chicago, when we're looking at gun violence in this country, when we're looking at the, the Keystone Pipeline, when we're looking at war policy, who benefits from any of this? It's corporations that benefit. Ordinary people, we don't benefit from it. The, 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 the countries, I wouldn't call them ordinary people, the 1%, yeah. <laughs> They're extraordinary people, my dear. Um, but if you, if, you, if you look around the world, the people of Yemen are not benefiting from the US drone program. People of Somalia are not benefiting from the U.S. putting warlords on the payroll and utilizing secret prisons buried in Somalia's National Security Service. The, the, the Pakistani people are not benefiting from the U.S. drone strikes and the CIA and military dirty tricks. The Afghan people aren't benefiting from the escalated night raids and the, uh, the periodic bombings that take place in that country. The Iraqi people didn't benefit from the fact that the United States invaded, occupied, destroyed that country, and created a situation where there's a civil war now in that country, and other nations are able to step across the border and get involved with it. The United States shattered Iraq. And now you have calls for the US to intervene in Syria. The US has been intervening in Syria for a very long time, and it's always been against the Syrian people, one way or another. When they use Syria as a, a source to uh, re render and torture, Maher Arar, then the dictatorship is acceptable. Then when it, when it starts to become against the perceived US interest, all of a sudden they become a butcher and a dictator. It's a story as old as could be. Just look no further than the history of Iran and Iraq and Saddam Hussein. The, the United States will support dictators and butchers the world over and say nothing about their butchery until it becomes inconvenient for the empire. And then, and then they'll step in and do it. So the point I'm making at the end of the day is that there already was a coup in this country. It happened a long time ago, and it was when corporations took control. When corporations took control of the political process and could purchase very easily and on the cheap politicians, then it became irrelevant what party they're members of, Democrat or Republican. Look at the way the big corporations fund campaigns. If the Democrats they are perceived to be winning the election, they'll, they'll throw their cash in favor of the Democrats, but ever so slightly. If the Republicans, then they'll push it ever so slightly. Because they know that, that, that there's never going to be anyone that thinks outside of that box. At the end of the day, no one will be elected president who is not what they call an American exceptionalist, who doesn't believe that American lives are worth more than the lives of others around the world. And from that simple 
despicable belief stems a lot of our problems. The idea that, that we somehow are more important than everyone else on this earth. That's, that's the bottom line for both political parties. Look at the, the, the sports-like atmosphere after the killing of Osama bin Laden and the cheering in the streets. This, this isn't patriotism. It's not even nationalism. It's, it's jingoism. You know, that's what it is. It's jingoism. And so my, my, my one challenge, and I know that there are a lot of people in this room that spend a lot more time than I do fighting for, for change, and I admire so many of you for doing what you do, but my, my sort of one call for people is a simple one. Um, and that is that I think all of us as, as, uh, as people have an obligation to learn the story of one person who was killed in a drone strike or in a night raid or had their life ruined in one of those types of operations around the world. And the next time someone uses the term collateral damage, you tell them about that person. Remember when, in the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing, you know, there were three, three people that were killed in that attack, and one of them was this eight-year-old boy. And, uh, and you remember that, that painting that he did went viral around the internet, that peace sign that he had made, and, and uh, it went all over Facebook, and it was really chilling and moving at the same time. And then there were two other, two young women that were killed, and one of the young women that was killed was a graduate student who was uh, from China. And, uh, and when President Obama spoke about the Boston Marathon bombing, he told the stories of the three victims of the bombing. And he, um, he mentioned this young woman's name from China. And a blog post went viral in China after that. And the, uh, the title of it was, Where You Die Matters. And the point of it was that the reason that the most powerful man on earth uh, said her name was because she died in that bombing in the city of Boston and that if she had been a factory worker making a product for American consumers and died in some kind of a fire no one would have ever known her name and the president of the United States never would have said her name <laughs> and th you think about it it's it's such a it's a simple point and it but it's such a profound truth where you die matters and, and, and that's something that we need to confront. And how, how do we do that? When we see the aftermath of these horrendous school shootings, why is it that they grip our society so much? It's because we relate to the victims. We see them, that could be our kid who was just going to school that day with the backpack that I put on them and sent them with the snack, and, or, or, the, or the teacher that, that is in front of the door trying to stop the gunmen from gunning down the, the children in the school. In all of these, you know, I, I think all of us are just chilled by it because we can relate to it. They, we see them as, one, as, as our own. How is it that we don't have an obligation to see children in Yemen the same way? I mean, I, I, I'm haunted by these images that, that we saw in the course of doing this reporting. You know, Rick Rowley, the director of the film, and I. If you've seen our movie, you know that there are the faces of many children in that movie. And part of what we wanted to do was to show people in this country the humanity of those around the world who are killed in the name of our security, but who never ever posed a threat to us. And maybe one day they will because of what we did. And, and that's chilling. That's a chilling reality to confront as someone who is a resident of the empire. When you go abroad, you're viewed, whether you like it or not, as an ambassador uh, of your country. They don't care if you support the policy, if you're CIA, if you're a journalist. You're just seen as an American. And in one of the last scenes in our film, there's this little girl in the village of Al-Majula whose family was killed in that first airstrike that President Obama ordered. And when we were editing our film, we didn't notice this until, until the very end. I said to Rick, what's, what's in her eye? And we blew up, she has these beautiful piercing black eyes. We blew up her eye. And if you, if you look closely, you see me and Rick. And I'm standing in front of her and Rick is filming her. And every day of my life, I wonder, what did that little girl think of me, the only American she's ever met and may ever meet? The only other Americans she's met were the missiles that took her entire family out. And I'm haunted by the thought of how she's going to see the world when she grows up, 
knowing what was taken away from her. And if, if we don't empathize, if we don't see the humanity of those people around the world the way that we do when it's our own people being killed in the school shootings here, none of this will ever fundamentally change. And that's our challenge. Thank you.